大家早，欢迎来到 p i c o m Taiwan 二零二三。Good morning, everyone. Welcome to p i c o m Taiwan 2023. I'm the session host, Connie. 今天呢，在活动开始之前，想提醒大家可以到 Hack MD 上面进行共笔，然后到 Slido 上面进行提问。Before the speech, I would like to let you know, please ask us Hack MD and、uh, write together. And this is the QR code for Slido. Please ask question on Slido, and we can let our speaker to answer your question. 今天的演讲主题呢是 the snack of scissors. The speech title today is the snack of scissors. 呃，今天邀请来的演讲者，他是 Python 三点一零跟三点一一的版本管理员，同时间他也是软体工程师，现在正为 Grumpen 服务。The keynote speaker today, he is the Python 3.10 and 3.11 release manager, and he is a software engineer at Bruben. So let's welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Pablo Garingo Saluato. Hello, everyone.、Um, welcome to my keynote.、Um, so I'm Pablo Galindo.、Uh, for the ones among you that don't know me, so、um, I'm、uh, from the Python core development team. So I'm part of the people that make Python the language. I'm also、uh, serving for the third year in the Python Steering Council, which you know is a, is a team of five people、uh, that basically decides how Python changes and evolves.、Um, I'm also Python 3.10 and 3.11 release manager, so we, I'm the person who is pushing the buttons to ensure that you know Python is released.、Um, but well, I'm here to talk about、um, something for all of you,、uh, something that I take the snake of thesis.、Um, so I don't know exactly how to pronounce thesis. I think it's pronounced thesis. Um, I'm very sorry if you actually know, and I'm butchering the name. <laughs> sorry about that. I'm going to try to do my best. So you know,、uh, every time I say it wrong, you can have a laugh at me if you want. It's, it's fine.、Um, so what is this about? So this talk is about、uh, what makes Python feel like Python, and I want you to reflect a bit on this. And、uh, hopefully, at the end of the talk, you will learn a bunch of things. Some of them are a bit technical, but don't worry, it's not too difficult. Uh, but the idea here is that I want you to reflect, right? Like I want you to reflect on what makes Python feel like Python to you. So what what is Python really, and 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 what is Python for everyone, right? And to do that, we are talking about this this idea of the、uh, the ship of thesis, right?、Like、the actual talk is just a paraphrasing on this.、Uh, so we are going to start over there. So let, let's this, let, let's talk about the ship of thesis.、Uh, so what is this 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 idea? So this is、uh, based on、um, some some、uh, Greek mythology.、Um, so the, there was this. Person called Theseus. It was a, a Greek hero.、Uh, obviously, probably that didn't exist. Who knows?、Uh, but the idea is that well,、uh, the story, as you will see, is a bit interesting. So very likely it didn't exist. Obviously,、uh, but the idea is that this person、uh, was the person who went to the, this this labyrinth when it was this monster inside the Minotaur, and you know there is a lot of political stuff over there, and the story is quite wild. But the important thing is that when、uh, he succeeded, he killed the monster and a bunch of things, and he uh, uh, came back to home. Uh, in、uh, in Athens,、um, and he came back in a ship, in a you know, in a ship by the sea, and people were so happy that they wanted to preserve that ship forever, and they basically have it there, and you know,、uh, when the 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 time was passing, they realized that oh,、uh, some parts of the ship were like decaying, like some planks or some、um, different things that need to replace it. So they replaced those parts, they changed the planks, they they put the stronger timber in some places, and、uh, things like that, and and the thing is that over Time,、uh, all the parts of the ship change, so so they have to replace all the ship as time was passing, right? But people still refer to that as the ship of Theseus, right? Like the <laughs> again, sorry for the name, but the ship that this person,、uh, you know, used to come back home,、uh, so it's very important. But it turns out that you replace absolutely every part of the ship. So now this gives us this interesting philosophical dilemma,、uh, which is basically: is this the same ship if you replace all the parts? You can still say that it's the ship of Theseus, or is just something else? Uh, this is quite important because, like, it's not only about the ship; it's about many other things. For instance, think about you. Uh, you are made of cell cells of different types, and、uh, these cells die, and they are changed by new cells. So im imagine that you know you when you were ten years old, and let's imagine you when you are like sixty years old. Probably there is not a single cell,、uh, maybe maybe neurons, but like most mostly all the cells、uh, in your in your body、uh, are new, are different cells. So so you are like the ship of fishes, right? Are you still the same you or not? Uh, probably you will say yes. Maybe maybe some of you say no because you know now we are wiser or something. But but the idea is that、uh, you know like、uh, when you have the situation, can, can, there is something. Is there is some essence 
that basically survives the material world um, when you can still say that, you know, it's the, it's the same thing. We are talking about the same person, the same ship, the same Python, right? So here, basically, the idea is that as we change Python, as we add things, we remove things, how we can we ensure that we still talk about Python and it's not something else, you know, a different language, right? So, so this is the, the snake of fishes or the ship of fishes, uh, the original name, and this is what I want you to think about in this talk. So how we can we answer um, this question? So let, let's, let's look at some ways to, to uh, look at how many things have we replaced already. So um, we can basically, uh, so, so we are going to mine in Python, you know, like this this initial ship that, that we know and love. And then after a bunch of, you know, changes that we are going to make, is going to transform into this other ship. And it's going to be completely different uh, because as you will see, we are adding things. Uh, hopefully it's a much better ship, but we still call it Python. So ca how can we ensure that, you know, this ship is still here is something that we can still call Python? This is the question. So let's look at some, some ways to do that. So, so in this plot that I'm showing you here, what we're seeing here is the code that was added in some years and how that code survived over time. So for instance, this blue over here is code that was added at the beginning of Python. So this was written by Guido Van Rossum. And as you can see, uh, this code was very big uh, in 2000. And over time, the amount of blue code diminished and diminished and diminished. And you know, today there is still some code over here. So, so you know, there is some, some code that was written in, uh, in, in, the, in the year 2000 that it still survives, but it's not a lot. So it, it, it has changed. It has been changed or removed by someone else. And then we can see this thing from different years. So this is code that was added in 2000. And we can see that today there is very little code that was added in 2000 that has survived. And we can do the same for many years. So for instance, code that was added this year is very, very small compared to the whole Python. You know, the whole Python is code that was written in many, many different years that still survive here. There is some interesting thing that you can see here. For instance, there is these two big, like sharp lines, with you know, show that a lot of code has been removed. Uh, there is one here and one here. One of them is basically Python two to Python three. The other one, I will let you to know to to decide what it is and then find out. Uh, but we can see here that um, Python is not like the ship of Theseus in the sense that we don't change things and it's the same ship, we replace parts. As you can see here, the total area of the graph um, keeps uh, basically being bigger and bigger and bigger, which means that um, we, we are not only changing and removing things, we are adding things and we are adding things quite a lot. How fast are we adding things? We will see. But the other question that we have um, is like, how many people are changing things? We can look at the most uh, active contributors of the project. Uh, so here are, I think, the 20 most active contributors. I'm over here. Uh, probably you can distinguish these colors. It, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but we can see, for instance, that uh, you know the blue line is Guido Van Rossum. So at the beginning, 100% of the code was written by Guido Van Rossum. And very quickly, this line went down. So for instance, look, at 2004, uh, only 20% of the code in the code base was still written by Guido Van Rossum. Uh, the other code was changed and are deleted by other people. As you can see, many people started to co contribute to the project. And if you go over here, you see something very interesting. Like, look, the 20 most prolific contributors of the project, uh, every single one of them contribute less than 10% of the code. So so there is less than 10% of the code uh, that is made by by every individual contributor, which means that, you know, we, we learn something. Like, the something is that Python is written by a lot of people, not even the 20 most, uh, you know, active uh, people can, can basically account for all the code base. So this means that Python is not only changed in a way that, you know, our ship, our, our idea is, is basically changed and evolving, but it's also been uh, the code, new code is being added um, in a way that basically is made by a lot of people. So this is this this makes the whole thing more complicated. If we want to ensure that Python is still is Python, if we have many people changing it, obviously, if there is only one people changing the project, that will be very easy to, to basically control because you only have one person to teach uh, how to do that. But when you have so many people, the thing becomes more complicated. We can also look at, at a mental experiment. So imagine that you have like a random line of code in the repository. And then you're asking, okay, so what, how many how many years do I need to wait until the chances that the random line is deleted or changed is 50%. Uh, so you can see here at the beginning, the chances that the line is in the repo are 100%. As time passes, the chances go down and down and down and it will reach 50%. And this is reached after five years. So five years is basically, if you added a line of, of code anywhere on Python, the chances that that line is still there after five years is 50%. So this means, this still tell us that Python is changing quite quickly. 
And this is important because it makes the whole thing even more complicated, right? To ensure that Python is still still feels like Python. Um, cool. Um, I want you to think about something else, right? Which is very interesting. Um, this is the feeling that uh, Python actually uh, is something that it doesn't exist really. Um, the same as this color. So I'm a physicist, so I'm going to show you a physics example. So think about this color, this pink color. Uh, will you believe me if I tell you that this color doesn't exist? Your, your, this color only exists in your brain. Like, for real, the, the, this color is not physical. It doesn't exist. Uh, how can I say that? Well, look at this. Um, at, at the end of the day, like, color is basically, m like, light hitting our eyes, and then our brain interprets that signal as a, the sensation of color. And light is made of these massless particles called photons. And photons can vibrate, you know, the electromagnetic field is vibrating, and it can vibrate slower or faster. And depending on that, we have different parts of what we call the electromagnetic spectrum, which is basically this picture right here. We have, uh, if the photon is, uh, you know, vibrating very slowly, uh, we have these radio waves we, we cannot see, but it's still light. It's just that, you know, it's, it's light, which uh, the frequency is quite slow. And we have also microwaves and infrared. This is basically heat. And then we have, uh, if the photons vibrate very fast, we have uh, ultraviolet, which you know can burn us, X-rays, gamma rays, and cosmic rays, which are super, super, super energetic, and we cannot see. But there is this, this, uh, there is this area over here that we can actually see. Our eyes can can actually receive photons from these parts, and we can see them. And if it turns out that you receive a photon of this particular frequency, your eyes will say, "Oh, this is red," and you will experience the color red. If you experience a photon of this here, which is vibrating faster, you will say, oh, this is the color blue. And obviously we know that if we have two photons, for instance, we have a photon that is red and a photon that is yellow, we will experience the color orange, right? So two photons, red and yellow, it will give us orange. But look, uh, I can also have one photon at this frequency, which will be orange. So I can still produce the color orange in your mind by giving a photon of this frequency. Uh, the same thing here. Uh, what about if I give you a green photon and a blue photon? Uh, we will perceive basically like greenish blue, uh, like this color over here, opal or something. Uh, but I can also give you a photon of this frequency over here, like almost 500 nanometers of uh, you know wavelength, and you will still experience the same color. That's that's fine. But look, uh, pink. This pink is not here. There is not a single photon. There is no frequency where, where where a photon can be pink. So so pink, the only way for your brain to experience the color pink is by a combination of photons. You cannot have a photon that is pink. Like the nature cannot produce pink light. The only way to produce the pink experience in your brain is basically having all photons. So if I have a photon of every single uh, frequency here, you will see white. Right, because all, all, all the colors together are white. And if I remove green, so imagine that you have all of these photons except the green ones, so that is pink. Pink is white light minus green. Uh, and that, But that color only exists in your brain. Like, it, there is nothing in nature that is green. It, it only exists in your brain, right? And Python is kind of the same. Like, you know, there is something that we can say is Python, and we are going to see what is that something. But different people will perceive different things. And every person has a different idea of what Python is in their brain. And when we are talking about preserving that idea over time, it's very important that we understand that, you know, like different people have different ideas and we need to preserve different things that exist only in the minds of different people. And this is quite important. Um, so, but, you know, you can still say, okay, so I understand that different people, you know, some educator will have a different idea over what Python is than someone working at Google, that someone working in academia, studying black holes or whatever, right? But there has to be something common, right? Something physical. Uh, here, okay, the pink doesn't exist, but there is this thing called electromagnetic spectrum, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, what is that thing for Python? So let's let's, let's dig into that. Um, so again, well, let's, let's keep in mind that Python only exists in our minds. Uh, quite important. Okay, so let's dig into that, and that something is called the grammar. So this is basically the photons of Python, let's say, <laughs> well, a very nice uh, sentence. So what is the grammar? So basically, uh, the, the idea is that, um, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, there is some things that you think is Python, but Python is actually much crazier. So for instance, here you can say, okay, what is this? This is Python. Oh, but it doesn't look like Python. It looks like C++. Look, it has this template thing, and it has this, like, like you know, like uh, ellipses, and, and this star T that looks like some other language. Uh, like, what is this well it, it turns out that this is python like you can parse this and you can produce this tree over here when like you know the dots are ellipses like like t is 
is just the letter T, like uh, the, what it looked like a template, it was just greater than and smaller than, and this is just valid Python, but probably you will say it was this is, this is certainly invalid. Um, this is because the Python that lives in your mind is a much beautiful Python. It's a it's a prettier Python than the real one. The real one is it's a bit ugly, and um, and it allows a lot of things that you will probably never use. But still, that is valid Python. It's the same Python as the one that you write, right? So so you know this this gives us the question of uh, what is really Python and who who, who says what is Python and what is not. And this is the grammar. And the grammar is a file that's going to tell us what is valid in Python. And I'm going to go a, a bit uh, over uh, how you read this file. So this file is going to basically contain a bunch of rule names. So, you know, for loop, while loop, things like that. And then a bunch of rule descriptions. We are going to see an example and you will understand very quickly. Um, we can have several descriptions for the same rule because we can have several options. You can. This means that this rule has two possibilities, this one or, or this one. Um, this is a bit verbose uh, to write. Uh, we normally write it this way. So we say that this rule can either be this or, this is the or operator, this one. Uh, so the or operator. We can say that a rule, uh, for instance, can be like one or more repetitions of the character A um, as regular expressions. We can also say that a rule can be zero or more repetitions if we use the asterisk uh, so of the character A. And uh, we can also have optional pa optional parts. So, so this rule is the character A plus optionally this other thing. So you have the character A, it works. If you have the character A followed by something that this works, uh, then it also works. Um, so you can actually use this idea uh, to describe itself. So this is what you know, partial people like me are very excited about is the metagrammar. So this is basically the grammar describing the grammar. So this is the whole the, what I told you basically describing itself. Uh, so you can see basically that a rule is an alternative or several of them separated by options. So you can say that a rule is something followed by optionally something else and something else and something else. Uh, you can say that an alternative is, is one or more items and an item is the optional part or something called atom plus the, the one time or multiple times. And then an atom is like a rule between parentheses, which by the way, recourses over here again, or a name, so the name of another rule, or a string, which is basically, you know, like the letter A or something like that. Doesn't matter if you don't follow it, it's just that, you know, there is a nice way to describe a grammar with the grammar itself. So how this looks in Python? Well, it looks like this, right? Like, and, and we can use our knowledge to parse this. So we can say that, okay, so so a valid Python is a file input, which can be a new line or a, 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 a statement repeated zero or more times, followed by an end marker. Okay, a statement can be a simple statement or a component statement, and then you can say, okay, what is a simple statement? Okay, it's a small statement. I still think that we don't know, but look, compound statement has if a statement, while a statement, for a statement. Okay, this, this is quite familiar. We, we know what this is. So, so things start making a bit sense, right? And if you follow, you will see that, oh, now I, I see a lot of things that make more sense. For instance, a for statement over here is the, is the word for, followed by something that is an expression list. We don't really know what this is, but then look, in, uh, that, that makes sense. And then colon, okay, so th this is like a for loop, right? Like it starts looking like a for loop. So as you can see, like this is a, a nice way that we can use to describe um, like like what, what what is Python, right? And this is quite cool and quite powerful because this file allows us to say this is Python and this is not Python and this is the technical thing. This is the electromagnetic spectrum of Python. This is what the Python is made of, that this grammar file. Um, and some terminology, because I'm going to use it in a second. When we have a string, we call these terminals. Uh, so all these strings are terminals. And this is because we cannot expand them anymore. Like the word while is just while. You cannot do anything with that. But then we have these other rules names, like all of these are different rules that we can expand. So, so there is something else here that, you know, is an, some other rule that we can go here and read uh, that they are called non-terminals because they are non-terminals. They can be expanded. Um, and then this is the interesting part. So Python used to be, it's not anymore, but used to be an LL1 grammar. And why this is important? Well, it's important because LL1 grammars are very specific uh, grammars. In particular, they are very, very simple grammars uh, and they are very restricted. Like there, there is very, 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 very few uh, l a few parsers and f um, programming languages that are popular that are written uh, with LL1 grammars. And Python used to be the, the major one. Uh, but now, no, it's not true anymore. And why this is important? Well, because this idea that we have that Python is very simple to understand and seem very simple to write and very, uh, you know, idiomatic was coded in the idea that it was an LL1, um, well, one of the things that was coded, it, it was an LL1 language. And why this is important? Well, because, because an LL1 language is a language that is very easy to parse, not only for machines, 
but also for humans. Like you are a parser. You, when you read code, you are a parser. So if the language is very difficult to parse for machines, then it's going to be very difficult to parse for humans as well. And we do, made a decision to start reading Python as another one language. So let's, let's check what this is. Okay, so another one grammar is a lang uh, grammar where the parser will read the text from left to right. So it will go from the left of the text to the right of the text. It will do leftmost derivation. This means that they will start expanding rules from the left. Uh, so you have like rule plus something. So it will start expanding the rule and then the something. And then the most important part, this is the actual restriction. That is, if there is uh, multiple alternatives. It will have to, uh, it will can only look one token ahead to understand which one of the possibilities uh, is the correct one. And this is the biggest restriction as well, because it means that you need to uh, solve all the ambiguity by only looking at the next token. And the other thing, which is, you know, it's not super important, but like for Python, uh, there is also the, the, the extra restriction that we didn't have epsilon productions, which are productions that matches the empty string. This just simplifies the parser quite a lot by uh, allowing us not to have something called follow sets, but it doesn't really matter what this is. Uh, so, so the most important one is the, the, the one token look ahead. So here, for instance, there is a bunch of like uh, you know rules for the uh, L1 grammar of Python, the the, the old one that we have, and uh, as you can see here, for instance, looking at all these del statement, pass statement, flow statements, some of them start with uh, these words, right? And then we have these expression statements, uh, sorry, this uh, small statement, which can be expression statement or del statement or pass statement or flow statement, right? So how can I know that I has, uh, uh, something is a small statement? So let's say I have the word break. Can break be a small statement? Well, um, uh, we can, uh, ta, 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 and if then I see, well, it doesn't have, uh, it has a break there, so it cannot be uh, a break statement. But look, I, for doing that, I have to go over all these possibilities and I didn't saw anything that was break. Break is a break statement over here and it was not in any of them. But how can I know faster? Well, look at this. These rules start with like some words. So they'll pass, break, continue, return, raise, something, something. So if I know, for instance, all the possible words that a small statement can start with, so for instance, a small statement can be a del statement and del statement can be del, so del can be one of them. So if I know all of them, I could tell you very quickly if that can be, um, you know, valid or invalid. So for instance, these are the first sets of these rules. Uh, for instance, print statement can only start with print, raise statement can only start with raise. Uh, but for instance, simple statement can start with all these words. Uh, so the question is like, uh, like is continue, uh, like something that starts with continue can be a simple statement? So you check the sets and yes, continue is here. So yes, continue uh, can be a simple statement. You know, obviously more things than that, but you have to, uh, as I can only look one, one token at hand, if I have the word continue, then it's, it's possible to, to, to be correct Python. So that's important and these are the first sets. And this is going to be quite important to understand some of the restrictions that we have. So basically, a first set is all the words that the grammar can start with. So there are some limitations of the grammar. Uh, so imagine that you have this grammar. Um, so there's the word do and a rule A, and then the word do and rule B, and th we have these this first sets. So the word A, we don't know which it is, but we know that it can start with the letter A and then the letter B, and the, ro uh, uh, the rule B can start with the letter A and the letter C. And then we have this source over here. Well, uh, if we need to decide if it's this version or this version, um, it's very easy to do because we have the letter B here and then we look at the letters that A can start with and then we see B. But B is not in, in, in this other rule, so we know that this is the first option. So if we have this source code, it has to be this version over here, the first possibility. Oh, but what if we have the same first sets, but we have this version over here, the, the, there is do and then an A. Well. Do is do, okay, so both start with do, that's that's okay. Uh, and then we have an A. So A, can I start with A? Yes. Uh, so it can I start with A. Um, so it has to be in the first sets of A, so maybe it's that possibility. But look, it can also be that possibility over there because uh, the first sets of B also starts with A because it's repeated over here. So we don't know actually which one of the two it is. Maybe if we read more here, we can actually decide which one of the two it is. But uh, as we can only look one token ahead, then we don't know. And this is impossible. This is what is called an ambiguous rule because the, the, you know, the, the parser cannot decide by looking one token ahead which one of the two is going to be. And this is not just a theoretical thing, it happens in Python. It used to happen in Python, as you will see. And this forced us to change the whole parser into something different. So this is ambiguous and it, it, it basically makes everything impossible. So let me tell you how we change Python. We are going to change our ship. We are going to do... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. 
we are going to do some big modifications on Python that is going to allow us not only to solve these particular problems, but it's going to allow us to write more powerful things. And we still want that, those things to feel like Python. And for that, we need to take this, this sentence in mind. I, uh, this sentence is so important that I have it actually tattooed uh, like here on my arm. And it basically says, Ars es clare artem, and it translates our it is true art to conceal the art. And this sentence basically saying that that um, something artistic is something that you cannot see how it's achieved. Like you cannot see the process. It, it's something that is invisible. Like the, 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 the way you actually make something artistic is just invisible for the art. You just see the art. And in the old parser was not, not like this because the old parser, you could see it. Like there the, the, the were these things when the parser was sewing and say like, oh, you cannot write this Python. Like even if you think this will be Python, it will be good Python. Uh, the grammar doesn't allow you to write this thing, so it's not good Python, and therefore it was kind of in the middle. So, so it's important that when you're creating these things, that that they don't get in the middle, so so they are successful. So, so uh, Python had this problem. For instance, with the walrus operator, this is the rule that we want to write. We want to write that you know the the, the, the walrus can be like a name followed by the walrus and then the um, like an expression or an expression that doesn't have the walrus. But it turns out that you check the first sets of tests name is here, which means that this name and this test are ambiguous because if you check name, it can be this version or this version. So this is ambiguous and we were used, we were forced to write this other more generic rule when instead of name we write test here and then in the compiler we do kind of a trick and see when we check, okay, that, that, that thing is actually a name and if it's not a name, we're going to write an expression. But look at this, this is wrong because this was done on the compiler, not on the parser. Like it's much later, and the parser is supposed to tell you what is correct and which is not correct. And but now we need the compiler just for some examples because the parser was not powerful enough. Uh, this also happens, for instance, on this other case when we are checking like um, the star expressions to check that you know you can only have names, attributes, and subscripts, um, and many other cases. And then we have this problem because with this file, which was supposed to tell us what Python really is, what is the pure definition of Python, turns out that that is not the actual language that we have because we have to write this other like tricky, hacky language just because the actual language was not an L1 anymore, even if. Um, it is it, it, describing Python. So, so that is one of the problems that the old parser has. But there is more problems. For instance, this uh, this over here uh, is something that you will really like to write. Like when you have multiple, like very long context managers, it will be very nice if you could like open a parenthesis and write one context manager, then comma another context manager, then comma another context manager, and then you close the parenthesis. This is very natural, and you will think that this is cool and this is real good Python. This is what people will think Python should be because you can do this thing in many other places. You can do this thing with lists, tuples, etc., and then you can do it with imports as well. So why you cannot do it in Python? Well, it turns out that, uh, sorry, this is something else, but it turns out that, that if you try to write this rule following an L1 grammar, it, it's ambiguous. Like it just it doesn't allow you to do it. The L1 parser doesn't allow you to write this even if you think that this should be Python. There is more problems, like for instance, rules in L1 grammars used to be super complicated, so they are very difficult to work with. And also they don't have something called left recursion. So if you have like, for instance, like uh, A plus B plus C, and then you're going to write a rule to uh, write, uh, express this, you will have some rule that starts with itself to create this kind of tree over here. But unfortunately, an L1 parser will, will not work with this because it will start, it has a left most derivation, so it will start expanding expression forever, which, you know, it doesn't work, obviously. Uh, so you need to write like something like this, which is a bit junky and it creates this, this other kind of trees uh, that then you need to like pre-process again into an abstract syntax tree that you want, uh, which is like not only more costly memory, but also it's slower. So, so, you know, a lot of problems here not only related to grammars. So we are going to change the parser. We are going to introduce peg parsers. So for, to understand what a peg parser is very simple, uh, we need to understand that you know the old parser and any parser uh, based on context-free grammars basically work by uh, using, like if you have a rule that has several alternatives to understand which one is the correct one, it would basically use math and uh, like you know this, this uh, automatas to uh, basically decide, looking at the next token, it will say, okay, the correct one, it has to be D. And if it's not uh, D, then it's nothing else because I use math and I deduce, I use this, this as a deduction, which one was the correct one. A peg parser will not do that. So a peg parser will try A. If A fails, it will try B. If B fails, it will try C. And if C fails, it will try D and so on and so forth. And this is the main idea. The idea is that the OR operator is order and it will try every single possibility in order. 
Um, so, so the idea then is that, you know, to do that, um, uh, every rule can basically return to possible su uh, status. It can be either say uh, something succeeds or something fails. And if something succeeds, then the rule succeeds. And if something fails, then it is not means that the, the, the text is wrong. It means try something different. Um, for and uh, the good thing about these spec parsers is that it, it, they are very simple to call if you have the grammar. So, for instance, if you have like three possible, um, and, you know, possibilities for a for a single rule. Uh, you can write code like this. You can try to parse the first as an assignment. If it f succeeds, you return the re the result. If it doesn't succeed, you try an expression. Uh, if, if it works, you return the result. If it not, you try that as an if statement. If it not, you, re you return. If it works, you return the result. And if it doesn't work, you return none. And that's how you say that it didn't work. So very easy to write parsers. Like this. Um, the problem with this is that if you're trying every single rule until something works, that is very expensive, as you can imagine. That is actually exponential uh, complexity. And to basically make it linear again and fast and nice, we use something called a memoization cache. So it's a, it's a quite a sophisticated one. I'm not going to explain it because it's, it's too long for this talk. But the idea is that there are ways to grab this like apparently very complicated and, and a slow parser and make it quite fast. With some caveats because you can still uh, you know introduce some problems we will see one funny example in a second uh, but the idea is that uh, these parsers are not ambiguous anymore like context free grammars normally uh, ambiguity means that you can have two possible uh, you know trees as we saw before like uh, you know a grammar is ambiguous if the parser cannot decide which one is the correct one but because here you're trying basically every alternative in order there is no ambiguity because the correct one is the first one that works so if two works the, the first one that works is the one that you're going to say that is is correct um, so we basically implemented all this new parser in PEP 617 together with Guido and Lisandros. And, um, and since, since Python 3.9, Python has this extremely more powerful parser. Um, it's actually um, so powerful that, um, as we will see, it has infinite look ahead. Uh, an interesting fact is that if you look at the commits, uh, so the first version of Python is the 1919. Uh, 1990, and uh, the peck parser was introduced in 2020, so it's 30 years since the the, the new uh, the old parser uh, was working there. Uh, so quite a long time for a parser written in 1990. It served as well. Um, so sorry, the dates are there. Uh, cool. So so the, the the these parsers are so powerful that they, they basically have infinite backtracking. This means that they can backtrack compared with uh, you know the the regular other parsers. They can backtrack infin infinitely. Um, to, to find like uh, which which one of the possibilities uh, cor is correct and this is what we say that is you know exponential time and if you don't introduce the memoization cache correctly it can have problems so for instance uh, this is a real problem that happened uh, if you try to parse this incorrect python syntax so a bunch of open brackets and then a colon uh, this takes two seconds if you try to parse like something a bit bigger uh, but it's still incorrect this takes over an hour and this was a real example it's an example that now is fixed it takes now a milliseconds um, but this was a real example because we forgot to add a cache in a specific place reporting error messages and you know here's the commit when I fix it this year 9 of February so again it's almost two years until this was reported but it's, it's a problem if you don't um, you know add, add the commits uh, sorry the memorization cache in your commits so you need to be a bit careful because you know with great power comes <laughs> great responsibility right also in parsers but now this parser is so great because it allows us to do much more uh, super powerful things. So now let's let's explore this new world. So then the new world is now that you you have this ship, right? Like you have the old Python and then you change a bunch of things in the ship, you create the ship and then you have now turbo powers. Uh, your ship is super fast. Now what do you do with this power? Because the objective is not to cr cr like transform Python into some crazy new language, it's to still make it feel like Python, but better. So, so how do we achieve that? And what things we can do? Well, one cool thing is that in Python, sometimes we're introducing new concepts. When we introduce async IO, we introduce these two keywords called async and await. And because they are keywords, it means that you cannot use them uh, as variables. So for instance, if you write now async equals three, uh, this is something that you could use, do in Python 3.4, for instance. Uh, right now, it's not uh, possible uh, to write that code or this code. You cannot assign to the keyword await because it's a keyword. But before, you could. So introducing new keywords used to be backwards incompatible. And that is bad because then what people in Python 3.4 thought it was Python, after the upgrade, then it's not Python anymore and people really don't like that, right? So using the new pack parser, we introduced this new concept called soft keywords. 
So the keywords can be now two different kinds. It can be a hard keywords, which are, you know, like a sink and away now or like for or if. Uh, basically, if you try to assign, it will fail. Uh, but the peg parcel allows us to have this new thing called soft keywords, which are keywords that are contextual. So if you use them in the correct place, it will act as a keyword. But if not, it will act as a variable name or a assignment. So your code will still work even if we added these new capabilities. So again, you will not have these situations. So if async and away were soft keywords, both of these situations will work correctly, which is nice because you know you will still maintain Python. So how this was used? Well, this was used for the first time in PEP 636 uh, structural pattern matching in Python 3 term. And um, the idea here is that uh, now you have match for a case as soft keywords. You can still assign to match and to case. You you know you can have these things as variable names or parameters in functions. Uh, but now you can have this super cool thing called pattern matching. Uh, for instance, I don't know if you have seen it here. This is just an example. Uh, so with pattern matching, you can say, okay, I have a command and I split the command. So I have now a list of things. And then you can say, okay, if I have a list with one element called uh, quit, I will, I'm going to quit my game. Um, but if I have a, a, the command is just look, I'm going to call this 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 function called look. But also you can say, oh, if I have if the command is basically a list with the word get and something, and I don't know what this is something, this is going to capture it. And then you can use it over here in, in a function call, which is super, super powerful uh, because you can have like, for instance, the, the different first commands and then capture the second thing and do different things with this. Uh, sadly, people think that this is a glorified uh, switch statement. This is much, much more powerful because it allows you to, you know, uh, match constructs uh, and, and a structure, which is super, super powerful. Uh, you can also have this this uh, underscore as a soft keyword, which is the default case. Basically, if none of these work, then then uh, underscore will be the default, which makes the underscore also a soft keyword because you know, like now it's acting both as a keyword and as a, as a variable name if you want to. But here's another cool example that you can have. You can have, for instance, the, a list. With with, uh, starting with the, the word drop and then uh, one or uh, sorry zero or more objects that you will use here so so this can be quite involved and by the way pattern matching now that we're talking about pattern matching is so powerful that you can have something like like for instance a data class like this click example so you're writing some kind of game and then you're checking like the user is clicking uh, uh, keys in the keyboard and then you can say okay I will get my event and this is one of these click classes I will capture the position uh, like attribute over there I will capture it it's a tuple so I will capture x and y and then I will call this function with x and y whatever this x and y are and I will say do the same thing as a key press a class which I will capture only when the key press is a Q and then I will quit my game and the same thing if, if it's like up arrow it will go north right so, so you can write these this dispatch loops in a very efficient way with and if you think about how, how you need to write this thing using um, you know like uh, conditionals it will be super difficult to do so 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 Python now has this thing that you can think is crazy it's just because you know it's new uh, but this it was only possible due to the to, to the parser right so so sometimes sometimes changing this this ship that we're talking about it makes these these possibilities appear and and you know not all the possibilities need to be taken but sometimes it allows us to have this thing that we we thought it was a nice addition to the language and it allows you to be super Super expressful, uh, so, 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 sorry, super expressive with little code, which is really really nice. You can do more complicated things like matching on dictionaries, but well, let's let's move on. Um, so all of this was only possible with the new peg parser. So now that you have this super elegant ship with like your sign uh, peg parsers, now you can still add things in a way that people still think, oh, this is still Python. Uh, still, there is some people that in their representation, they may not think like that is Python, but that can be true or that can be also because it's just new. Like, oh, this is uh, something new. You know, it used not to be that way. It, you just need some example. As an example, for instance, F strings, when they were introduced, people really hate them. Oh, some people really hate them. And now everybody loves them, right? Because like they are super useful and they are fantastic. So, so this is a good example that sometimes you only need time. So another example of changing things uh, in a way that two different people think different things. So, so this, is, this is a really uh, interesting case that happened to us, which is type annotations. Uh, so there, is, there are uh, two main topics here, which is that uh, static typing and dynamic typing. And uh, I'm just not talking about dynamic typing uh, languages. I'm talking about the usage for uh, annotations in Python. So in Python, you can have annotations used as a static typing. This means that you're not going to do anything with them when Python runs. You're going to run tools over the source, and the tool is going to tell you something. This is, for example, MyPy. 
So my pipe will look at your source and it will tell you, oh, there is this, uh, you know, typing problem over here. You need to fix it because you're passing here a string and this function expects, uh, uh, you know, a float or something. And you can do this thing without running the code, which is super useful because it will tell you bugs before you even run the code. And here, uh, dynamic typing is basically uh, like using these annotations at runtime, so to validate, for instance, that you are actually passing a float even if uh, you know you receive it from some JSON. And an example of this is Pydantic. You know, uh, it will validate it only when Python runs. So these example, these uh, these things uh, only happen when Python runs. Uh, so this this we're introducing different peps. So originally, when we introduced the uh, you know all the annotations in pep four four eight four, uh, we only were thinking about the static usage of these annotations. So all the feature sets and all the ideas were introduced uh, with this in mind. Um, then uh, we realized that there were some problems with this. We will see which ones in a second. Uh, and then it was this uh, pep five six three that introduced this idea of having from future import annotations to treat all annotations as strings, which fixes the problems. I will tell you in a second which problems. Uh, but turns out that this was uh, still not f uh, working for all cases because people that are using annotations dynamically uh, still needed the actual objects there, right? For example, Pydantic. So recently, we have another pep which uh, was recently, um, you know, then, uh, accepted by the steering council, uh, which basically introduced a mechanism for allowing these tricky situations to work. So, so quite a lot of um, different uh, ways to approach the problem and uh, to fix the problem. Just because you know, turns out that using annotations uh, at runtime is important for a lot of people. So for some people, they don't think that annotations should be used at runtime, but for other people, they really like that. And these are the two different pythons in two different uh, groups of people. So the problems are the following. So imagine you have a, a function foo and then your function foo has basically a type called my type. But this type is defined later. So how can you write this uh, if the type is, is, is defined here? Because when you execute this code, wh what Python is going to do is something like this. It's going to create an annotations dictionary with uh, x and my type, uh, sorry, and x and y, which are the names of the uh, parameters in the function uh, as strings. And then it's going to invoke my type over here and uh, what you define the function. And then it's going to stick this dictionary in the annotations uh, you know, group. And then it's going to define my type. And then it's going to put the annotations in the, um, in the notations. The problem here is that obviously you define my type before this. This is going to uh, raise an exception because at the time you put my type here, this doesn't exist because it's defined later. So that is a problem. So with pep, um, so the stringify versions of annotations, what it will do is that it will treat all annotations as a string. So my type now is a string. Um, there is no problem because even if you define my type over here, because this is just a string, uh, a, a type checker like my pie will basically be able to resolve that these two are the same because it's just treating the source as a string. It's not executing it. And when you execute this code, you will have the string my type, which you can always have, and you have no problem. The problem is that things like Pydantic and other usage of dynamic uh, uses of annotations will need this to be the actual class my type because it's going to check things like is instance and things like that, and this doesn't work for them. So the new versions, uh, the new pep basically does this trick using the scripture, the descriptors, when it basically instead of defining the dictionary at global scope, it, it basically has a function that returns the dictionary, and this has my type as a closure which is also something that you can have even if my type is defined here as my type here is a closure then this is al uh, this is correct because at the time this function executes if my type is already defined this works and then basically the way you you get the the annotations now is through this this descriptor over here um, uh, which basically is like like a property so when you get the annotate um, um, f uh, the annotate field, uh, this will be called and then it the dictionary will be returned. So annotations works correctly as you will expect. Um, so, so this means that you know there is different ways to see annotations. Uh, even if you don't only um, care about uh, all, all all of these aspects of dynamic versus static typing. For instance, uh, people that uh, you know are doing a small projects and education, they normally don't see annotations as something super useful because they kind of get in the way. They 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 see it as something super complicated because it has a funky syntax and now it's a bit difficult to read. And they they don't see Python as something that should have annotations. But on the other hand, if you are living in like uh, the enterprise world or you're doing like large projects then you know annotations become very useful why 
because annotations can now be used in uh, to find complex problems with MyPy or to have you know auto completion in IDs because it can tell your IDs like VS Code and things like that what are your types and then you can get like nice auto completion and it will help you refactor and do static analysis and much more. So these are two different groups and every of them uh, will have a different idea of what Python is. But we need to ensure that all of the things work here, right? For everyone. So at the end of the day, you know, this was a very complicated discussion, uh, you know, in the steering council and the co developed team. And at the end, we actually accepted PEP 649, even if it's quite complicated, uh, for Python 3. Uh, 13. So so next year, uh, that will be uh, the way you will get annotations to make everyone happy. But even if you make everyone happy, these two groups still exist, right? Like there is people that still don't feel like annotations are part of Python. And uh, there is people that love annotations and think that, yes, please, let's have more of that. And we, we need to find a way to, to make sure that Python, the actual platonic idea that we provide, uh, it works for everyone, even if they don't want to use some features. And the last thing I want to say is because it's kind of like new and, and it's important as well, is this, this, this work that we are doing and we are starting to uh, remove the gill which is a quite a big thing. So the GIL is this is, is the global interpreter lock and is this thing that uh, prevents you to write um, like like Python code that is parallel. Right now with the GIL, you can only have one thread running Python code at the same time. Uh, so, so it turns out that this, uh, there is this this uh, gentleman called Sam Gross. He works at Meta, and in seven and the seventh of October two thousand twenty-one, he submitted a, a draft to the Python mailing list with a, a, f a fork of C Python targeting Python three eleven. Uh, sorry, this is wrong. This is not three twelve. It's three eleven. Uh, and he saw that it was possible uh, to remove the gill without having a you know a huge performance penalty. So he did this with a lot of like super clever engineering, but also adding a bunch of like optimizations to. A account for the things that made his Python small, uh, slower. So uh, after a lot of time, so this is the first submission and this is the actual next step. So the 9th of, the, the of January of this year, he created a PEP. So so the Steam Council could decide. Uh, PEP 703 is a fantastic PEP. It's quite long and technical, but it's, you know, uh, as this kind of PEP uh, needs to be. And a lot of discussion happened between these two months in the Steam Council and the community because this PEP is super complicated and it is very difficult and, and you will see why. And uh, the 20th of July, we decided in the Steam Council to tentatively accept PEP 703, which means that we are going to, uh, you know, accept it with some caveats. But as you can see, it took us a long time to decide that we wanted to follow this, this path. So why is this a challenge? Why, why, what is different, difficult with this no-gill thing? Well, the first thing is that uh, even if this works and it's a fantastic word on engineering, it's quite complicated. This complicates C Python quite a lot, and this I'm talking about maintenance here. So, so this makes uh, this basically makes Python very difficult to maintain, which means that it's going to be harder for us to fix bugs, harder for us to you know like like uh, solve add new features and ensure that it works with everything, right? So, so it, it means that maintaining Python will be harder for the people that we're doing that. And then it has some compatibility problems because C extensions like NumPy or Pandas and things like that, or SubPy, they may not be compatible with the guild because, you know, right now they are thinking that there is a massive lock, uh, but when the lock is not there, then now what happens? There is also a performance implication. Okay, so, so you can have parallelism and that is quite nice performance. You know, and now you can have like multiple threads running Python. Yeah, but like now, uh, what what happens with like a single thread Python? Like that when the guild doesn't matter. Well, uh, maybe it's a bit slower, and maybe uh, you know some of the things that no guild needs is are incompatible with the faster C Python team optimizations that we have right now, right? So it's Python three twelve and three eleven are much faster than three nine and three ten due to the work of the faster C Python team. So so no guild may not be the best fit for that. And then packaging is it can be quite complicated because if the no-gill is uh, binary incompatible, it means that you need to generate binary wheels for gill and no-gill, which means that every single package needs to publish uh, twice the same number of artifacts, which will complicate and, and it will complicate testing and, and packaging quite a lot. So we are now trying to figure out how to solve all of these things to move forward. Um, but on the other hand, it's quite nice because, for instance, if you execute this code, which is calculating Fibonacci numbers with a bunch of threads, so a uh, thread pool executor, this is the uh, classic benchmark to measure how bad is Python with the guild. If you use, uh, you basically say that 100% of the execution time is Python with the guild, well, running Python with, uh, with without the guild is 5% of the running time. So this is 
this is basically 20, fi- ta- uh, 20 times faster using 20 threads. Obviously, you use, use 30 threads, it will be 30, 30 times faster. Or in another way, uh, you are doing 30 times the work uh, in the same time, which, which is what you will expect. Um, if you have the guild, then it will be even slower than single thread, which is very badly. Um, but then uh, you have different types of programs. You can have IO bounded code, which will um, will not benefit a lot from this because they are basically waiting for the kernel to do something uh, and having like multiple threads running is not super, super, super great here. It doesn't really matter that much. It matters, but not a lot. Then you have CPU bounded code, like, you know, executing instructions or numeric work on things like that. This is going to benefit a lot from uh, no guild work. And obviously in reality, you will have something mixed, right? You have some threads that are doing IO bound and some th- threads that are using some CPU bound, like the coding and encoding and things like that. And a lot of the workflows in the world are like this, therefore they will benefit a lot from from this parallelism. So we are really really excited, and everybody is really excited about this this no no guild world, even if it's going to be a bit tricky. Uh, so the timeline that we have think in the steering council basically looks in the three stages. At the beginning, uh, so no guild is going to be basically marked as experimental, and then we'll be basically we will be gathering some information. We will understand the problems, and then we'll figure out APIs and interfaces, and we will not ship no guild builds. So so people need to basically uh, build them themselves. Uh, or, or or getting them from somewhere. Then uh, I mean these 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 years are basically um, just uh, for illustration. Then in uh, after three years or something like that, we w- call this supported, and uh, it will still not be the default. So the default will still be guild, um, but we will have a target when we want to make it the default, and then we will start shipping official no guild uh, Python versions. And after five years or more, uh, we will have to see if this works. Then we will o- have no guild as the only build of Python. Everything will be no guild and only no guild will be provided and all the extensions need to be compatible with no guild well the reason we have this is because you know at the end of the day we don't want this to be python 2 to python 3 again uh, and it's not going to be called python 4 so that's for sure uh, so don't worry about that we want this to be smooth and, and you know it's a very complicated challenge and we want this to run correctly um, the, you know, C, C extensions. Oh, sorry. So C extensions have some 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 challenges that they need to deal with now because you know they uh, d- they have global state. Then you ha- in an Ogil work, then that is not going to work because th- multiple threads can mutate the global state at the same time. Uh, the buying will be much harder because now you can have these like complicated like race conditions that are more complicated the way the Ogil work uh, works. Uh, C extensions may have used like as an implicit lock, which you know now. Uh, you you may have data races that before you didn't have when you have the guild. Um, you know, different C extensions may struggle now to work with with other guild extension uh, with with other extensions if they put locks around the interfaces and the locks can deadlock. Um, then the locking infrastructure can be quite quite difficult because if you put locks around every single call to your library, uh, that 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 library is going to be now much slower because uh, you know acquiring locks is quite expensive. So you need to put the locks only when it matters, and that can be quite complicated. And also checking that your extension is correct is very difficult because you cannot use no normal, there is no tools to tell you, yes, uh, your extension is correct and it works in no guild. It's just very difficult to validate. So this is going to become possibly, we will see, um, uh, very complicated for C extension authors. So we will see what happens. Uh, but, th- but this is going to be an inter- interesting time because there are a lot of uh, complicated things. Uh, but we are going we are going there. So at the end of the day, you know, many challenges, still the same ship, still the same Python. And as you can see, uh, there are very different things that we are changing on our ship. Uh, there are very different things that we want to alter just to make the ship better. But some of them is basically changing some, some stuff from some new stuff to maintain the ship. And some of them is just adding new cooler things uh, w- uh, with at the same time making everyone feel um, that um, you know Python is still Python. But as we saw, there is different Pythons in different people, right? Like some people like annotations, some people don't like annotations and people will think that Python should have the guild, some people think that Python shouldn't have the guild. So at the end of the day, this ship that we are talking about uh, is basically on everyone's head and what we are changing is something that basically projects over them. 
Um, so this is a difficult challenge, as you can see, and we are doing our best. We are also just humans, so so you know uh, it's a complicated thing to do. We we commit sometimes errors, um, and we need several peps to to change it. But at the end of the day, like you know, the idea of um, ensuring that people still feel like the sh the new ship is still Python is basically by maintaining uh, and understanding these core ideas, uh, what makes Python Python, and ensure that at least it works for everyone. And maybe not perfectly, and maybe some people will like the new additions but at the end of the day if it works and is better and people are still uh, you know l l l people have uh, this joy of writing python and they still feel like you know oh this python that i'm writing is very easy to write and it's very pleasant to write and i love to use python because it has this ecosystem and these uh, fantastic people and you know at the end of the day it's not just the technicalities of python it's also the community so it's the people that go on the ship that makes the ship also the same right if if uh, everybody's nice there uh, and you know that if you go in the ship with us you're going to have a nice time then it's uh, still the same ship that you know and love so uh, again uh, maybe not a lot of answers here um, but it's an interesting journey like uh, uh, like the one that we could do in this in the ship here and I hope you have reflected a bit on, on like all these topics like what makes Python Python um, how, how to change these things like if I change everything it's just a new language is Python 3.12 the same language as Python 3.5 there's a lot of questions and the aim of this talk was to make you reflect a bit on these questions and more than giving you all the answers, right? Even if I give you some some interesting answers or what I hope it are some interesting things. Well, so given said that, I, I hope uh, you you enjoy this. Um, so here are, is my email and my Twitter account. Uh, you can contact me if you want if by email or, or in Twitter or now it's called X. So you can use X if you want. <laughs> uh, but uh, I will be super happy to talk to all of you. Of course, now it's going to be, I think, a, a Q&A. Uh, I'm going to be actually on the other side of the world at 4 a.m. in the morning. I'm very happy to answer your questions. Uh, so please ask me any questions you want about these topics or any other topic that you that you want. And I hope you have enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. <laughs> I hope you enjoy the uh, speech tonight, uh, today, sorry. So let's show Pablo online, please. Say hi to the Taiwan audience, please. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, Pagan Taiwan. How are you doing? Oh, I think everyone is still enjoy your uh, speech. So, uh, would you like to start your Korean session? Uh, so, so um, I'm super happy to be here. Actually, um, uh, thank you. I'm a bit sorry that I couldn't be with all of you there. Um, uh, but you know, like uh, the life uh, always gets in the way. Um, but maybe, maybe another year. Um, I hope the the you know was not uh, too fast. Uh, I know I speak a. a, a quite fast, uh, so I hope uh, you could follow nicely. Um, and I think we have some Q&A right now, right? Yes. So can you share our Slido, please? We do have so many questions on Slido. So when you scroll right. down, yeah, and see like one question you want to answer, uh, answer first. OK. So let's go, with the, let's go with the first one. I think the first one, let's, let's start from the top. OK. So we have, uh, so what is the biggest difference between Python 4 and Python 3 if Python 4 appears one day in the future? Oh, this is a very good question. Um, so, so if we ever have Python 4, um, it needs to be something like, it, it has to be something like it's fundamentally, it, 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 like it changes the language in a, in a fundamental way in the sense that, for instance, it will be something if we change the C API or something like that. Uh, uh, we, we learn and we don't want to repeat that for sure. So we are not going to have another Python 2 to 3. Um, so Python 4 will not be as disruptive as Python 3 was. Um, that's the reason, for instance, if we remove the yield, we are not calling that Python 4, like for sure. Like we already know that. But, um, but if we ever have Python 4, it's because we have changed something like quite big and we want to make it clear that, you know, in some ways the old version is not fully compatible with the new one. Um, and if, uh, if you ask me, I think in that case, what we will be talking about is the C API. Uh, so this is like the, 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 the way compile modules for Python interact with Python, like NumPy or Pandas or TensorFlow or things like that. Um, and right now it works, but, but you know, it's not the best. So if we ever try to improve it, um, that will, uh, in, a, in a substantial way, and we change it, then maybe Python 4. 
Um, but I, I cannot see any other way because right now we, we learned the lesson and we don't want to, you know, create another situation like Python 3 uh, from, uh, from Python 2 again. Uh, so if we ever have Python 4, it may be even like be your name. So, so you don't need to worry about it. <laughs> Okay, ma. <laughs> you're mine, ma. Now, uh, please, uh, we go next one. Okay, so the next one says, uh, as a thought experiment, if we have, uh, if what we have is not Python, what would you describe it? Um, so I, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but I will try to answer what I understand. So, um, so in, in, in basically the talk, what I was mentioning is that, um, you know, when, when, when you have like, a specific core that in this case it will be the grammar right but like uh, it can be many other things um, there is another question down there of, of like what what is python but um if you like the, the interesting part here is that all the parts that are not python um are still it there, there are two possibilities right one of them is that uh is it still the python of someone else in the sense that maybe uh i don't know maybe for me my experience of python doesn't include let's say type annotation uh, but maybe for another person it does. So the, maybe that not Python is their Python. But on the other hand, like uh, there is many things that are not Python, uh, and in that case, it's, it's a bit hard. Um, one interesting case of this: what is not Python and what is Python um, is actually when we show you uh, error messages. Um, I don't know if you know it, but uh, in Python 3.10 and 3.11. Um, so me and my college in the uh, Python C Python core development team, we have uh, done a lot of work improving error messages uh, in the interpreter. And the interesting part about error messages is that uh, you need to tell the interpreter what is not Python. Because at the end of the day, if I show you an error message, it's because you type something that is not Python. So having uh, to, like, in order to provide good error messages, we need to not only teach the, the, like the compiler and the parser what is Python, but also what is not Python, uh, or at least some parts of them. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very muddy waters because the amount of things that are not Python are infinite, so, so you can have an infinite number of things that are not Python. Um, but, you know, trying to, to maybe explain like what is almost Python um, is, is, a bit, is a bit easier than you know, trying to explain like what, or describe what is not Python. That's kind of a too big, uh, too big to, to, to properly describe. Cool. Let's move to the next question. 我跟他补充一下哦，就是呃，因为我们今天问题非常的多，所以我们可能来不及回答所有的问题，因此等下帕伯会选择他可以先回答的问题先回答，然后其他的会慢慢再在网络上再补充答案。uh, because we had too many questions today, so Pablo will select question right now. But the question we have an answer later, we uh, Pablo will select, uh, will answer all. So don't worry. And uh, because we notice the rank, uh, the ranking of the questions continually. So let's scroll down again. And how about answer question you want to select? Right, right. Uh, rank, the rank um, is changing all the time. I see. Let's go with this one that says, uh, "Can you share one mistake you made as a Python release manager?" Oh, well, I made many mistakes. Um, hopefully, they are very easy to revert. Um, so, for instance, I think well, I don't think it's a mistake, but um, like one of the things that that was difficult to fix was when uh, we changed the name of the branch from master to main in Python, and and uh, that was quite hard to record because that broke GitHub. Apparently, the Python repo was so, so many jobs on the GitHub back and that it just, it just broke the whole website. Um, that is not a mistake, but like, you know, it's a, it's a weird thing to say. Uh, in, a, in terms of actual mistakes I have made, um, uh, hopefully, like, the, the, the good thing about making mistakes as release managers is that you can correct them and nobody sees them. But uh, some of the classic mistakes that I have made, for instance, is that uh, when, when you finish, like, the release of a branch, so let's say you're releasing 3.11, so you prepare like all the changes to 3.11 that are needed to be the release, and then you basically merge that those changes into the 3.11 branch, so you can see it in the Python repo. So sometimes what, what happens is that you tag the commit before the merge, um, and, uh, and that's how it's supposed to be, but like so sometimes I made the mistake of tagging it after the merge, and that triggers like a tag in a different commit because the merge commit is different. And when you push it to GitHub, then uh, like 311 is not what you said is 311. And there is that many systems that start failing. Um, but that's fine because like we, we, we have systems that check that. 
and then it tells me that something is wrong, and then I can just fix it very easily. Um, but yes, I mean, I mean, um, there is there is not a lot of mistakes that you you can see uh, because we we tend to correct them. Uh, we have to normally restart the release if something like this happens, um, or like if there is any problem that we have never seen uh, and only happens on Windows or macOS. Uh, this happens more often than than you will think. Um, but but normally, you know, at the end of the day, you you have like your Python version, and and there is hopefully no mistakes that are visible. Cool. Let's 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 go to the next one. So, this top one is the uh, what's the biggest uh, difference between Python for you want? Ah, so we, we already uh, I think answered that. Let's go with the next one that says how to consolidate everyone's understanding of Python and lead the team members to successfully develop a new Python. Well, that is a fantastic question, and it's very, very hard. Um, so, so it's impossible. So, so one realization is that it's impossible to consolidate everyone understanding of the language. It's just because there are so many use cases, and those use cases are normally contradictory. Like, for instance, there is people that are using Python to teach, um, uh, people that have never seen programming, and you know, making the language more complicated goes against that, right? Uh, on the other hand. You know, like there is usage of Python, like enterprise Python, when like you know people have uh, almost like millions or, or, or millions of lines of code, and you know having things like annotations and um, things that you know tooling and, and things like that is very important. And and sometimes you know these things can 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 be true at the same time, but sometimes they are very difficult to to go together. So here, like the, I think the, the to answer your question, like the, the way we try to consolidate everyone's understanding of Python is first ensure that we understand what different people need. Like, and this is very important because like it's very easy to just focus on the things that you care. Like as a, as a Python programmer myself, I care about some things and I don't care about some other things. But um, the moment you are in a position of responsibility, you need to care about everything because you need to understand everyone's needs. Um, so that's the first thing. You, you need to ensure that you understand what people need and what the, the, the struggles that people have and the difficulties that people are experiencing. And once you understand those things, it's just a matter of like cost. So for instance, someone proposes a new, uh, let's say a new grammar feature. So should we take this new grammar feature? Well, let's see. Um, if we add it, maybe, you know, it, it, it's quite difficult to, obviously when you add something new, is, is you cannot remove it. So, so if you add it, you need to check, okay, so what is this solving? Oh, okay, is this solving this particular case? So how many people are impacted by this? What is the maintenance cost? Um, is it going to force everyone to learn it? Like how intrusive it is, how Pythonic it is? Um, is it just uh, like it will advance any other areas? And different cases uh, have different answers. Like for instance, when we added exception groups, uh, you could think that that only affects async IO people, but we actually think that this is a, like new enough uh, you know, exception control mechanism that was warranted to be uh, in, in, in the language, even if you could argue that initially this was only for async IO. So, so it's a very hard thing and sometimes we get it wrong, uh, but hopefully, you know, like we, we, we put a lot of hours and a lot of efforts, like many, many hours, on making sure that everyone's vision and needs are represented. So, so very, very, very good question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. It's pity we only have ten minutes, so it's <laughs> almost there. So, uh, Pablo will answer more questions online. So, please uh, provide your answer, uh, question online. And uh, thank you again for Pablo. You're maybe you are in London, you cannot be with us, but we are very happy to be with you right now. 呃，非常谢谢 Pablo。虽然不能今天不能来到台湾，但是他还是跟我们分享他的经验值，还有他回答这些问题。如果大家有任何问题的话，请在 side 上面再放上您的问题。等一下，我们的 Pablo 我们会再把他的答案提供出来。那非常谢谢大家。我们今天的呃主要的 session 已经结束了。那接下来我们还有三个 session 会继续下去。首先这个是 R 零的地方，我们这个地方呢，等一下会有一个是呃是 Pico 所有的演讲。然后呢，他的主要的语言呢是英文，他的。同天也是英文，主题呢是 Comparison of Packing Tours in 2023. Uh, next session in this room, we have uh, our speaker is Pico, and uh, his speak title is Comparison of Packing Tours in 2023. Uh, 接下来在 R1 的那我们会有一个主题呢，最主要讲的语言是中文，投影片呢是英文，主题呢是升级 Q 呃 C course， 嗯 C course camera means 二点零之路。Uh, in room R1, we have uh, our speaker is Kenji Park, and uh, the speech title is 
um, upper grade C curl can meet 2.0, and the speech and language is in Mandarin, but the PowerPoint is in English. And 接下来呢，在 R2 的会议室呢，我们有的讲者呢，他是 Irish Chen， 他的主题呢是呃、uh, ，changing in data cleansing and the transformation mistakes, confused, uh, confusion and the solution. 嗯、um, ，他的沟通的语言呢是中文，但是投影片呢是英文。Uh, for in our room R2, we have our speaker is Iris Chen, and the speech title is、uh, "Challenge in Data Cleansing and Transformation: Mistakes, Confusing, and、uh, Solutions." So,、uh, welcome to join the next session, and、uh, we'll see you later. 非常谢谢大家参与，我们待会再见。